Hello and welcome to this special edition of Market Talk on designing the future food service experience in association with Marco Beverage Systems. I'm therefore delighted to be joined today by Marco's Commercial Director, Daniel Versi, as well as Jack Sharkey, Managing Director of Vision Commercial Kitchens, and Arno Kasovic, the former exec chef at EAT, and also the founder of a soon to be launched QSR concept called Loaf and Coal. Hello there guys, thank you for joining me today. Um, over the next half an hour or so, we're, we're going to be exploring what the future of food service design might look like, especially given the blurring of lines between traditional retail, food service and F&B environments. Um, Daniel, we'll, we'll kick off with you. Uh, there's been a considerable amount of, of product innovation within Marco's portfolio over the last 12 months. How heavily has this been shaped by the kind of changes that you're seeing in the marketplace? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, we, we have seen changes. There's been a, a general trend over the last number of years to uh, a move to under-counter systems where Marco have been kind of leading that 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 charge. It, um, it's been across uh, across um, uh, segments, so in convenience, in in uh, horica, in you know cafes uh, and the like, and so you know that that trend has continued, and you know we're adding adding to that that those ranges with uh, kind of touchless solutions in, in in this environment that we're coming out of, where that's uh, obviously quite relevant, and uh, the need for multi-use systems with uh, you know sort of one system to do many things. We're seeing that as a as a trend, and sort of the the move to specialty and and craft made to order. Um, products, which uh, and and, and uh, uh, is 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 a, is a trend we're seeing. So yeah, that's the kind of the uh, the sort of the overarching trends we've seen. And you know, the the COVID has affected some of those. The touchless solutions have definitely been accelerated, I would say. Um, but that move to under counter was uh, was was growing every year. Um, it, it, it it frees up counter space. It, it creates less of a barrier between the customer. You know, you're trying to serve, uh, and um, we've seen that across across many industries. So. Yeah, that's they, they would be the, the, the main trends we've seen. And it's interesting that there was obviously an element of, of these trends happening before COVID, but as you pointed out there, th things like the, the touchless systems and so on are, are now coming to the fore even more because of the, this, the environment that we're in. Um, it, presumably now when it comes to designing new equipment, that there, there are more considerations that you have to think about um, for the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, touchless was actually something that was happening before we were actually working on solutions uh, before that, because actually self-service was becoming more a part of people want, wanting to offer, say, premium water, so chilled, filtered water at a self-service operation. And touchless would be have some advantages in that space where it's, uh, you know, would, 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 would have some benefits on workflow. Also, there's, a, there's an argument there on on buttons being, you know, with with customer facing would be, you know, the use of buttons and whether sensors are actually more reliable over time which is uh, interesting as well so yeah absolutely the um covid has sped up a lot of those developments but you know they were kind of the, the direction was there and, and as i say the you know marco in the 12 years i've been working for the company is uh, has seen a a, a huge uh, swing and we've been leading that charge to, to the move to under counter so you know a big part of our sales now is uh, is under counters not just hot not just water hot and cold but coffee systems uh, with things like the sb9 which produce you know single cup filter coffee which is you know, made to order um uh, by the barista automating that process so automation is is again you know coming across you know catering and coffee in, the, in sort of the worlds we play in um absolutely and uh, yeah so touchless automation under counters are all, all things we're seeing uh, and uh, I, I can, can't see really uh, this situation slowing them down Sure. Yeah. Okay. And and Jack, for you, are some of those themes quite familiar in the conversations that you're having with some of your customers, particularly those with more of a retail-led um, business? Yeah, very, very familiar. And I, you know, I echo what Dan says. There has been a move to clearing the counter, creating more space on the counter, and getting rid of those old traditional-looking water boilers, ugly-looking things on the worktop, and kind of making it a lot more sleek and design-led. But I think there's also some other areas that, and I don't know how the Dan's found this, but, you know, there's been a bit of a, I found over the last two or three years, there's been a bit of a tea revolution coming through as well. Um, you know, tea's become much more trendy and much more to the fore as well. So some of the products that, that I know Marco do and do particularly well, where you can have multi-temperatures on, on hot water as well, where you, when you're looking at those specialty teas, it really helps to be able to work with those different water temperatures. So yeah, uh, you know, we've got afternoon teas, we've got clients who are working more on the retail side, on the tea, on the tea side. Um, yeah, 
we're starting to see that blend of your more traditional coffee shop, your know, tea shop, moving into the retail environment as well. And obviously, beverage has become such an important um, area, hasn't it, for a lot of for a lot of food service operators now. And uh, you know, I think they're taking that much more seriously than they than they perhaps in the perhaps were in the past. Certainly, in terms of the variety of beverages they they provide. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you know, I, I think. I think you can't underestimate how, how important the, the food and beverage and the beverage side of it is just as important as the food side of it in, in any operation, whether you know, you're full hospitality or you're kind of just dipping your, your, your toes into the hospitality market. You know, beverage is a is really important part. I mean, sure, Arno would agree with that. Yeah, and Arno, you're, you know, to bring you into the conversation, you're currently in the process of launching uh, a, new, a new food venture. Um, called called loaf and coal, which is which is due to launch uh, next month when the the industry gets open again inside. Um, yeah. <laughs> tell us about some of the preparations that you've had to go through and, and some of your thinking around um, you know around your concept. So I've had to really adapt to. I've been I've been spending the last um, eight years in London, so being a director at Eat, I meant that I was heavily involved with uh, opening shops uh, internationally as well in Spain and France and around the UK. Um, I've had to adapt to out of London business. Um, you know, the pace in London is fast, it's all about speed of service. Um, but a lot of people have moved out of London, whether their offices have disappeared or they're working from home. And what we've decided is to, is to go where, where everyone's gone, which is uh, the West Coast and the South. Uh, I found a site in Bournemouth and where I found sitting of the business, I mean, you're speaking, I've had about eight business plans so far. So I've had, I've had to adapt. <laughs> constantly to, to why I think it's a need. Um, I think the need is for quick service, but for it to be good value for money and to be authentic and it's to be traceable as well. So, uh, so I've taken some of the experience from grab and go, mixed it with sort of gastronomic experience, you know, in working mission star restaurants and so on. And, um, and what I'm doing is I'm setting up a business that's based on tech. So uh, people who come through our doors, they would use QR ordering but what they will get will be sustainably sourced food, sourced locally when possible. I don't think it's absolutely essential. But what's essential is that the food is going to be free range, it's going to be, it's going to have an ethos, it's going to be sustainable. Um, and I'm using technology to be able to cut uh, my staff cost and give better value for money and, and get a, a great footfall by the right pricing strategy. Um, so what I've done essentially is taken some of the London experience, mixed it with some of my experience in the past, and I'm taking that outside of London, and I'm using, you know, the latest in train of equipment, you know, using a, a Unox combi oven, to be honest, I've, I've never been able to afford any of this before. And, and now I'm really investing in technology to try to deliver that, that quick service. Um, so I'm learning an awful lot uh, doing it. I think I'm learning that you know, the food business outside of London is very different, very, very different. People expect a bit more, they expect it to be served quite quickly, but the standard has to remain the same. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And as you mentioned there, you spent, you spent a lot of time at, at EAT um, pr prior to the takeover by, by Pret. Um, and obviously they were, you know, a kind of bastion of the, the high street grab and go food service model. Um, you know, do you, do you think that model will change now as we move into this um, sort of new era post-COVID? Or do you think we'll see a return to, to how the market was before for grab and go? I don't think it's going to change massively. Um, but what's going to change is the London scene, really. The pet is, is huge in London. Um, and I think it'll take a while for London to get back to where it was. Um, you know, where the offices have moved out, you know, it's not going to be the same level of people who are in a rush to eat. I, I might be wrong in thinking that, but I think people are going to want to have an in-between. They're going to want to be able to, to sit down and have lunch and take maybe a bit more time to have lunch, or, um, or they're just going to do that at home. So, uh, you know, the concept of uh, a good example is Wagamama, you know, speeding up their service and having a, a quick ordering like you have at McDonald's. I think that's brilliant because the quality of their food is remaining the same, but they're, they're able to serve, to, to serve people a little bit quicker but equally, you look at businesses such as uh, Code Brasserie, who've done really well during uh, lockdown, doing home deliveries. I think they're going to flourish. But what they've got now is they've got the legs of their business. So when they used to have people coming to their sites and spend an hour or two eating, now people can eat at home. They can come to their sites or they can 
be great and good as well. So people have to adapt. But they've developed businesses that are a lot more sustainable because they are selling in, out, and on the net. Um, in the business I'm setting up, I'm going to be selling online, I'm going to do grab and go, and I'm going to serve people to come in as well. So I'm not going to rely on just one avenue of sales. I'm going to rely on multiple avenues to make sure that my future is bulletproof as much as can be. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, and I think as you allude to there, it, it's it's about um, you know providing convenience for all for all channels um, and, and, and being as flexible as possible. You know, and that that also goes for, for the equipment side. So, so Daniel, if we if we come to you, um, you know, when we talk about this area of, of innovation, what, what does innovation mean to you from um, from a manufacturer point of view? And and you know, how much time are you spending on that area when it comes to introducing new products into the market that can support this sort of new way of, of serving? Yeah, well, we, we uh, innovation, Marco's, uh, you know, 40 years we've been, we've been designing, you know, and uh, beverage equipment and, uh, you know, we, we always have a, one would argue, a, probably a two full innovation roadmap of, of new products. We, uh, we listen to our market constantly. We, we want to, um, we, we play in a relatively narrow field and we want to be innovators and leaders in that field. So, you know, what we're seeing is, uh, is, you know, to your point, Anna, with the, with our sustainability of, um, and provenance of food and, People are, you know, the, the I think, you know, the move to away from single use plastics will continue. I think, you know, COVID has been a, a blip in that with regards to, you know, maybe there's you know, the, but I think ultimately single use plastics will reduce. Um, so there's, you know, there's the growth of concentrates and, and you know, of, uh, of, of craft concentrates, for example. So you, instead of having a ready to drink um, beverage, you would, you would use a concentrate and, and use chilled sparkling water to, to, to create a craft soda, for example, or a craft beverage uh, at the point of dispense. There's, you know, the seasonality is, is we're seeing huge. So you need the ability to change up your system, you know, obviously, you know, seasons in the UK hot versus cold in summer and, and uh, we're seeing that and you know the operators need to do more in in small spaces you know I think actually you know you're going to see less foot less footprints of indoor space so smaller footprints indoors and bigger outdoor spaces I think that's going to be a trend you're going to see so the you know the need to be able to do more in small more in small spaces is is, is something we were seeing before and I think that's only going to be accelerated um yeah and uh yeah as I say so you know the, those sort of trends of of um you know the you know this the, the sustainability and and to go to Jack Jack's point really of you know people people if they're going to go out are going to want the, the, the a special service so whether it's a special uh, afternoon tea with you know with a uh, single origin estate teas from a from a you know specific has a as a has a story behind it has provenance behind it um and would and we'll pay that a little bit more for that i think and, and understand that they are you know they're you know they're not they're not taking away from the environment they're probably adding to the environment and that, you know that they are you know maybe adding to the producers in the coffee world and the tea world that they're not um that, that you know, that's important to them and uh, you know our products help help with that um you know operators are looking at the whole life of, of machines as opposed to just you know the the, the cost of them up front we're, we're never going to be the cheapest units um sold but you know the whole life costs energy efficiency is important as important now as it ever has been so you know the, the mix that jack talked about there with three temperatures it's the first boiler that has vacuum insulated tanks so it you know significantly reduces the the heat loss in the in the boiler therefore running costs are far lower so you might pay a bit more day one but you know over the life of the machine it's going to be it's going to be less so all of these things i think you know operators large and small will want to look at that as opposed to and actually you know is this machine going to last me five years as opposed to two years and actually ultimately that's better for the planet and better for the environment so you know it's, it's kind of uh, i think those things are they're important to us we're on a we're on a program to you know to become a, 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 a we are sustainable or even more sustainable looking at you know how our, our um our um our corporate governments and our you know esg and, and trying to you know, improve there so that's the journey we're on as well as a business so um yeah that's kind of the trends i see and, and uh, as i say you know reduction in single-use plastics and that kind of move towards uh craft uh, made to water beverages is kind of uh, we, we, we will continue to see that i think moving forward sure but i think i'm done i think it's also interesting though it's not just in in hospitality and retail that we're seeing that it's, it's in the workplace as well so you know, we're seeing you know wider ranges of machinery going in, and, and, and more expensive machinery. You know, like your freer type units going into the workplace environment to be able to offer that flexibility on you know on hot, cold, and sparkling water environments to to, for, to create that sustainability as well. 
So yeah, we're, we're seeing that across multiple multiple sectors, not just in hospitality and, and retail. Yeah, and, and so in corporates, instead of having instead of having a, a fridge of bottled water, what you know, and you know, you see it in restaurants where you, instead of having you know bottled water, you know, that, which is, is fine, but there's also you know you know filtered premium water bottled at source for the restaurants for for meeting rooms, like you say in workplace, Jack. Absolutely, it's just the, the trend is going to continue, and I think only be accelerated when uh, you know mm -hmm. by by. Uh, yeah, it's only going to accelerate. Is it, uh, you made a great point there as well about about the footprint, um, you know, of F and B environments and, and kitchens moving forward as well. And you know, th th there was a squeeze on kind of kitchen space prior to the pandemic. Um, Jack smiling there, so uh, I'm sure that I'm sure that resonates. It's coming to you, Jack, you know, presumably that's just playing a massive factor now in terms of the spaces that you're designing. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a revolution potentially coming as a result of the pandemic over the last 12 months. And I think there's I think there's going to be some fundamental shifts in certain parts of the marketplace. And what I mean by that, and there's probably three or four different things that you can kind of pick up off the back of the pandemic. And they could probably be summarised into where we are currently today. You know, right here, right now, we've only got dining out, you know, outdoor, outdoor dining spaces that we can go to. And I think that's going to that will stimulate a bit of a revolution into al fresco dining into the UK market. I mean, it's, it's popular in, in in France, in Germany, in in Italy, in Spain. You know, I go to Italy in in November, and December, and it's you know three, four, five degrees uh, centigrade, and you are still dining out. You know, because they gear everything up for that outdoor dining experience. We haven't dealt with that in the UK, but I think the pandemic is going to has forced us, and will continue to force us to do that. So I think the uh, the al fresco dining uh, revolution is I think it's going to come I think it will go get will gain momentum and as people wear the right attire and they put, get the right environment outside with the heaters and the, the protection I think that will stimulate that growth into out outdoor outdoor dining spaces so pe operators will start to think about how that works within their businesses I think Dan Dan picked up on a point before you know and you said it yourself Andrew kitchens have been constantly under pressure about reducing but if you can extend, extend out into your outdoor dining space and i think the, the second part of that revolution that's going to come through and i've seen it with a number of clients through the pandemic they've become very focused about what's on their menu they've consolidated their menu that creates several things it means they can potentially look at smaller footprint kitchens reduce their staffing costs consolidate their purchasing and, and reduce down their overall operating costs. So I think when you couple those two things together, I think you've got a bit of a revolution potential coming through. And I think operators will start to look at that a lot closer. But I think you, you're you right, Arno, in terms of customers still want to see that sustainability. They still want that provenance and they will pay for that. And I think if you wrap all that up in that experience as well, then, yeah, you're on some good thing. I think it's, the last it's, thing I would say... It's interesting, is, Jeff. You, you've just described my business plan there because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I've been looking at how I can serve high-quality food at, at a medium to low price at speed. And uh, you can't do it the way you operate a normal restaurant. I think the, the way normal restaurants are created is, is just a bit dated. Uh, the way I look at it is I like the idea of having a site that supplies others you've got smaller footprints in you've got smaller kitchens we're essentially assembling food that's been prepared in one spot and what that means is you've got more consistency you get better quality control as well it means that you can keep ordering stores a lot quicker as well so yeah, this is the format we use that each you know, we have 135 stores um you know, with a, a single production unit uh, where everything was made it was a lot easier to control the quality and to send it out from that unit this is what I'm doing. Um, you know, I, I've got a site where I've actually divided floors up to production, uh, send and serve. Um, even if it's in the same building. And what that means is that it, it gets me ready to an expansion. Um, because if I can do my prep from the top floor to supply the bottom kitchen, I can do it from anywhere. But what that means as well is that um, I don't have to force myself to work more than 40 hours a week. You know, I want to give them quality of life. Um, and it means that I can serve food quickly. I don't cut any corners. And, you know, as you said before, I mean, personally, I don't want to be using plastic bottles because I think it's a bit backwards. You know, why should you do that? I think you need to think forward. And um, using equipment and technology to do that and applying common sense. And I think you can only go the right way. And 
what you said, Dan, about using, um, you know, uh, sort of, you know, bottling uh, water on site, if you like, I think that's brilliant. I haven't thought about that. And I think if I had a, a tap of sparkling water that was filtered, I would, I would rather do that than have to buy bottles of made of plastic flown from Turkey or wherever. That makes no sense at all. So, um, so I think that the pandemic has really pushed everyone to think more carefully. People expect more from their money. They're ready to pay for an experience. Um, but I think I quite like the idea of outdoor dining. You know, if, if, I, if we could bring the France and Italy to the UK, <laughs> I think you know you couldn't go anywhere else in the world. It, it would just be perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't yeah. think there's any reason why we can't do that. And I think I think there's also another bit of a revolution happening as well. I mean, the pandemic has pushed a lot of people to work from home, and as a result of that, they 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 they've been working out in the suburbs. So the city centres, unfortunately, you know, they take a real battering. I think the city centres will start to recover. But I think the fact that people have been working on more from home has stimulated them to eat out more local. So I think there's going to be a, a, a much bigger move to people eating locally and eating more local, which will open up bigger opportunities for operators to move into those suburbs rather than just concentrating in the city centres. And I, so I think that that's that's another one. I think I know you said it yourself you kind of you've come out of London, you've moved out into smaller cities in the suburbs. I think that is is quite a revolution as well. It's going to come because people aren't going to be in the office as much. People will be working from home more. They want, but they'll still want to eat out and they'll still want to go out on a more regular basis. And they will look for local places. And I think that will stimulate, uh, you know, a, a, another layer of the economy as well. If you, if you talk, sorry, Dan. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, I was going to say. I think well, Pre we're open to saying they've stopped. They've stopped following the skyscraper. That was a, a policy change that they made. You know, they they are moving to those suburbs. And you know, talk to um, our, our uh, my colleague in Singapore. You know, even in a city state, you know, the move out of the central business district is happening now, and and it's uh, you know it's moving to the suburbs. And you know, to your point, Arnold, with with regards, to, you know, I was talking to a, a, a new concept in the states where it's a drive through concept. You know, huge in the states with drive through, and they were they were looking at doing their almost their entire beverage op the beverage menu from concentrate so you know that was doing you know coffee better you know cold coffee tea uh craft sodas all from concentrate and so it would be it would be craft concentrate served at the point of dispense quick repeatable and that's that's you know that's so you know so that's kind of you know that's not going to see everybody but it's you know that from a you know it's it, and it's done at a really high level um but it's that it's repeatability and to your point it's it's you know it's, it's done it's done at a it's, a it's an automated level where you're taking using technology to to deliver a really great experience and uh, yeah. that's kind of what you're sort of what we're, what we're seeing i think we're we are still behind the curve with technology within the food service environment i think there's still a lot more to come yet and we talked i think you picked on it before dan in terms of um, innovation the food service market generally in terms of equipment has been generally just about incremental innovation rather than radical innovation. And I think we'll start to see some radical innovation coming through over the next 12, 18 months, 24 months, because I think a lot of the manufacturers are kind of looking at it in terms of staffing costs, footprints in kitchens. So I think you'll start to see a lot of innovation coming through in the food service market and using, utilizing that technology as well, because consistency, um, Consistency and footprint space and staffing costs, they're, they're, what, they're what operators are looking for day in and day out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and presumably, Arno, these are the things that have been on your kind of tick list as you've gone through the process in, in the recent months of preparing to open, you know, your site down in, in Bournemouth and, and hopefully more beyond that, thinking about all those elements. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, to, to be honest, um, six months ago, I was looking at opening in central London a food to go uh, business. And I soon realized I really need to think very differently. Um, so, yeah, of course, for me, staff cost is essential. Uh, but most of all, um, you know, I find that I can't eat anywhere on the go that, that's good food, that's sustainable. It just doesn't exist. You know, you, I've got nothing against the likes of Burger King and McDonald's. It's for, you know, target audience. It's not me, but I wish I could go to them and have good food. Uh, I can't find anywhere. And... You know, I've got food allergies, which means that I can't really eat out, um, you know, because, you, you know, there's no traceability. You know, most places I would go to, they would just not know what they're serving. They have a bit of a clue as to what it is. But 
I went to Bills the other day, they refused to serve me because they couldn't say for sure whether there was rapes in all or not in my food. And, and that's really scary that you're being served food that no one really knows where it's from. So um, I, I'm really excited about the prospect to be able to offer food that's fast food, but it's, uh, I'm not saying it's going to be healthy because it won't be necessarily that healthy, but it's going to be <laughs> delicious. It's going to be affordable. It's going to be British beef. It's going to be free range. And I really think that that's the way to go. I, I think, um, if the likes of Pret, um, you know, they've got, they've got nowhere to hide anymore. You know, I don't think anyone wants to eat Brazilian chicken. You know, you, I, I think people are going to, to start thinking differently about how they operate businesses so they have a more sustainable approach to what they do. Um, and I really think now is the time to do it because when people come out of the lockdown, they're going to spend the money that's been burning their pockets. There'll be a lot of competition. And um, as an operator, you're going to have to, to give something that's a bit different. Um, Otherwise, people will just go to McDonald's. I know. If you think about what you, what you just said there in terms of the provenance of where that food is coming from, and if the, if the lessons are learned over the pandemic, people would rather have better quality with provenance and a less choice, but done well, than, you know, 150 items on the menu. That's that, For me, I'd certainly want that if I was going into an into a operation. I'd rather have four products that are done well, that have no the provenance on it, and I can get it when I want it, how I want it, where I want it. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think I think a, a proactive approach as well. Uh, for, for example, uh, I started looking at um, at coffee and where we could resource the coffee. I thought I could buy coffee that's from a middleman somewhere and it's been flown from South Africa, sent to Italy and then sent to the UK and packed. And I can't do that. You know, I, I'm buying my coffee straight from the farm in El Salvador. I'm bagging it in a 10 kilo bag in a box and I'm going to bag it myself. Um, because I think that's the right thing to do. You know, I think you've got to make sure that everyone gets a fair share. And, uh, and it's the same in uh, using the equipment. If you've got the right equipment in place, you're going to be able to give your staff a bit more of a chance to be consistent. They're going to have more of a chance to do their 40 hours a week rather than just firefighting to try to get something out of the door. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually learned that, funny enough, I've been in the trade 25 years. The last two months, I realized how important it was to really invest in technology. Um, you know, I'm only 44, but I think I was a dinosaur before that. <laughs> uh, I did not realize that you have you know, a Marco boiler, to have a proper coffee machine, to have you know, a good combi oven is absolutely essential because technology will help you to cut your staff, but the staff you're employing will get very better. They'll have more working conditions, better working conditions. Um, so I, I really think there's a bit of a revolution. I hope it's not just me. I don't think it is. Um, I think, I, I, you know, the large brands, oh, sorry, sorry. The, the large such, as, such as Pratt are going to try to come out of London. I think they're going to struggle because their business model it, it doesn't necessarily work out of London as it does in London. And we saw that at it. We opened stores in Manchester, which we shut very quickly. Birmingham, which we shut very quickly. You know, the business model only worked in London, not outside of London. So um, I think it's going to be tough for some. Yeah, sure. And um, I, you know, all of this points to that that great word experience, which I think you've, you've all mentioned at some point during this discussion. Dan, just to, to finish you with you as a, as a very final point. How much do you expect experience, the customer experience, um, to play a part in, in future food service design? Uh, well, absolutely key. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning of the, the, of the, of the call, um, you know, our systems allow, hopefully break down the barrier between the person serving, you know, it's coffee, whatever, whatever they're serving and, and the customer. And, you know, we, you know, the successful people that we do, you know, make a, an absolute and make a, make they're, they're joyous of serving their customers. That's what they're there to do, and uh, and you know, serve them great food, but also serve them with uh, serve them with passion, with the, and with a with a with a smile. And 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 actually, what automation does, what um, what you know, syst systems that enable uh, you know people that want to give that great hospitality and it allows them to do that because it gives them more time to do that and actually engage with their clients as opposed and offer that great service as opposed to you know have their head Head into a, a brewing a coffee or making whatever they're making. So I think you know that's that's really where um, you know I think the, the operate the operators that will survive. Sorry, will will, will, um, will do well is is absolutely and and what 
makes people return you know so we have customers and that's you know that's uh that the successful coffee shops other people where they 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 you know they they take a pride in in that in that service they offer and obviously i can't see that actually it's only going to be more important because people will go out and they, but they will go out i think in a, in a in a way that is uh that they will be more more choosy with where they go and they'll go where they know they're going to get that great experience yeah well thank you thank you so much um to all of you some fantastic insight into into what we can expect in the in the months to come clearly clearly plenty of changes ahead um and also plenty of, of kind of big themes that are out there shaping the way that that, that people are going to eat and, and and how they're going to consume food um so daniel jack Arno, thanks very much for your for your time um and to everybody watching we'll see you again next week with another episode of market talk thank you <laughs>